All right, so you know who I am. I had an introduction. This is me in 1994. Um, I do a lot of conferences, and most people have a baby picture, so this is not a unique idea. But it relates to my talk somehow, because for me, this is one of the most important moments in my life. Not here, but in a car park in 1994 on my way to Jewish summer camp for the first time. Um, I'm exactly the same as I was then. I still even own that T-shirt. Um, and this was when my parents decided to get rid of me for two weeks every summer and send me away to Jewish summer camp. Um, to, not just to learn about religion, but to experience life on my own as a single unit, not part of a school or a family or anything, but just to be independent and uh, it was an amazing experience. At the age of seven, you're mixed with kids up until the late teens, and then you're led by people in their early 20s uh, up until the 50s. So it's a, it's a melting pot of all ages from all over the United Kingdom. Some people came over from America, and it was definitely one of the most formative moments in my career at this age, my career started young, um, of learning how to be myself and learning who I was and also learning how to interact with everyone and, and really what I, what I cared about, what I was interested in. And at that time, this was what I was interested in. Um, <laughs> so 1994 was the year of the Spice Girls. That's when they formed. They kind of later years were their successive years. But after, you know, this seven-year-old experience at summer camp, I went on to be a big Spice Girls fan. I was always Posh Spice. Um, now I would probably be scary. But um, at the time, I was Posh Spice. And it was a time for me where I had my own personal interaction as a, as a, as a, as a child, not as a little sister or daughter listening to my brother's or my parents' music, but of finding some music that I wanted to listen to that they hated, which was even better. So it was about finding what I wanted to do, what I wanted to be. And for me, I know it was prepackaged merchandise shit, but as a seven-year-old, that's the best thing you could, you could ever have. If you can have a lunchbox and a poster and a duvet cover, you know, that is a great, a great thing to a child. So through finding the Spice Girls and going to Our Price and buying 99p single CDs, which now feels like I'm talking about vinyl, but my equivalent of, of that, I found other music too. So this is kind of where my story starts and where... I did start to kind of listen to what my brothers had around and, and, and I was judging records by their covers, literally, because that was all I had to go by. I didn't have any way of accessing the music in advance. I think back in the day you could, you could listen to the top 10 albums on headphones in the CD stores, um, but that was it. It was whether you liked the record sleeve. So I listened to lots of great music because a lot of great music had great designers. I listened to a lot of bad, <laughs> bad music too, but... You know, Daft Punk, Stevie Wonder, Jamiroquai, I mean, I wouldn't say that was great now, but at the time, it, it was. But then something changed. Then LimeWire happened. So, so for me, going from this kind of antiquated experience in our price, which is now been and gone for a few years, um, bootlegging arrived and piracy came, which I think is one of the best things that's ever happened to the music industry. <laughs> that's quite a controversial thought there, but for me, bootlegging meant that I could experience an entire new world of music that I never even knew existed. And I grew up in the leafy suburbs of North London. I didn't know about Riot Girl and punk. So LimeWire then I found all of these things that I never had known existed, and I found out about Riot Girl. So Riot Girl was a movement mostly out of America, like mostly centered in Olympia, after the punk, punk movement, building on women, empowerment of women, you can do whatever, and men, of everyone, you can do whatever the fuck you want to do. You can play an instrument. You're not going to stand at the back and hold your boyfriend's coat at the shows. You're going to be on the stage. So this whole um, culture sort of came into my life a little bit late. I was probably about 10 years late, but I, you know, I, I can't go back in time. So I only lived through things later on in the internet as we do 
every day. But this is a great quote from Beth Ditto of The Gossip, who kind of like the last Riot Girl band that came out of Olympia. And most people would think they're pop music now, but they, they, they crossed over. But, but Riot Girl really used the core elements of punk and also DIY. And DIY is kind of the core of my talk today. And only in retrospect, when you have to come and stand on the stage and talk about your work, do you start to realize what the themes are, where they came from, where in your past, um, your youth, these things kind of evolved. So this is the core kind of ethos of the punk DIY movement. Um, it's almost like hacking, modern day hacking, but hacking your life, hacking your career, hacking anything you possibly can. Um, and these sort of things, I looked back. I looked back to find this ethos and pull it out for my presentation. These from words from Wikipedia, but these were things that I feel are instilled in me naturally. So at this time, this is kind of like first year at university. So I think we were trying to work out when we graduated. Well, how many years ago was it? Well, six years ago. So we graduated about six years ago. So this was about four like two years before that, so eight years ago, I'm really terrible at maths, basically enumerate. But anyway, um, this was my first fanzine that I did, kind of as a reaction to this discovery. And I found an old, like, broken photocopier, I dragged it home, installed it in my bedroom, filled it with carbon, and started photocopying everything. And then I discovered this, the most important technological design. I've, it's the ugliest, most backwards, most terrible piece of software in the, on the earth. Worse than LimeWire was, that's for sure, but it allowed me to do so much. So what was kind of good about MySpace was because it was so horrible, is that you would want to make it look better. So this is what my MySpace page actually looked like. So through hating this, I learned how to build this. So sitting on MSN and messaging people, um, my friends, being like, what's that overlay HTML code again? And going on tutorial sites and, and just searching through all of these places, I discovered how to customize my MySpace page. It's still, oh no, it's gone now. Well, they rebuilt the whole platform and now my MySpace page looks like everybody else's and I don't even know how to log in and delete it. So it just remains there as a gravestone. But then learning that code taught me how to do this. So I built my own website off the back of learning how to skin my own MySpace page. And, you know, it's these sort of discoveries that we all make and all, from generations to come will we'll, we'll also go down that path. And, you know, these things come together to create what I think is the most amazing kind of DIY utopia that we have at our fingertips right now. And anybody who ever asks me a question, I get so angry because you just have everything in front of you to find the answer. Don't be so lazy. So one of the other things that I like to stress is this illusion of a wall, of a barrier between here or here or there and here or your teacher and your student or you, the, the designer you look up to or the illustrator that you, that you love. There is no barrier. It does not exist. There is no difference between anybody. And a lot of people, especially people coming up through our antiquated industrial um, education system, see a wall between what they have and what they have taught and what they want to do. And it's kind of my goal in life to, re to, re to remove it, scrub it away. So DIY is design it yourself. It's absolutely no fear. If you can't fucking do it, learn how, because it's your only choice. <laughs> Art school ain't going to teach you nothing. Okay, so you have to go out there and, and make it happen. You have to bullshit your way through any situation that you can. If you can't, if you don't know how to design a house, it doesn't matter. Just you know what to do. It's inside of you. If you need to pull the research, the architecture, the engineering together, you'll get there but you just have to have that motivation. That's the most important thing. And I was told before that I shouldn't use the word bullshit in my presentation, so I'll swap it for this one, because that's really what we're doing. I don't even think about myself as a designer, really. I'm just 
totally improvising. This talk today, I sent it in last night at like 12. You know, everything in life is, is an improvisation. And you'll only succeed through improvising. So this is an example of an improvised piece of work. This is, guess what, a storyboard that I did for a music, my first live action music video. I've never sh I'd never shot one before. And they, the DOP, who I'd never used before, the director of photography called me and he said, oh, can you send me a storyboard? I was like, pardon? A, a storyboard, you know, pictures of what you want me to shoot with notes. I was like, okay. So this is my storyboard for um, the Audacity of Huge video that I did for Simi Mobile Disco. And you'll see there um, these little dinosaur boots that, it, it was a lyrical video, so I think the lyric was, oh God, I bloody blanked on it. Double, du double Dutch dinosaur duplex in, du in Dubai. So I was thinking of a dinosaur on the sand skipping. But I can't do that because I don't have the money. So I did dinosaur wellies do, skipping in some sand. But we didn't have a small person to wear small Wellington boots. <laughs> so luckily, the gaffer had really thin um, double jointed arms. So he skipped for us. So, you know, all of these things are improvised. Ice cream is made from mashed potato for music videos. I didn't know that either. But my co-director, Joe, who I did it with, she had learned that previously. So these are all things that you have to pick up on the job. Um, we couldn't afford to pay Damien Hurst royalties for his skull image, so we dipped a plastic one bought on eBay in glitter. And I'm just going to show you a little excerpt of the video just to show you how much we bullshitted. <laughs> Cardboard. That's real fruit that I've painted. There's a wellies. So yeah, we made a music video and we made it without really knowing what we were doing, but it, we learned how to do it. All the stuff was bought on eBay. We produced it ourselves. So another thing that I kind of like to harp on about is how, you know, a lot of these design conferences, I, I sit and watch with other people and they talk about these planning and research and traveling to the library or interviewing people and like, I don't have time for that shit. I work in the music industry. So I like to think that simple is cool. Um, and I don't really need to know too much about something and I can still kind of create a good piece of work. So I just wanted to show you some projects where I narrowed down absolutely everything to the sort of smallest, finest degree because a lot of the time I don't have the money, I don't have the time and or scale to work on projects that are very complicated or span at a large time scale. So these are short little projects is what I love to do. This is a music video for uh, an artist that came out last week, shot on a monochrome camera, and just close-up shots of their body parts. Yeah, so, you know, what a simple idea with a, with a great tool and a small group of people can create a nice piece of content. So the same thing happened again with the Wildest Moments video. Jessie had the idea that she wanted to sing the song in one take, and I knew she could do it because she, every time I shoot her, she does, doesn't mess up her performances ever. It's always us that are messing up, and she's always nailing it. So this was Jessie, I, Jessie's really, really simple idea that we executed with her in a collaboration. Yeah, so we shot 23 takes, and that was the 14th one. And there's just a moment where Jessie's lip 
goes a bit wobbly and she looks a bit, I don't know, like there's a sadness there that was totally natural. So that's why I chose that take, just that simple, simple moment. So other, other simple executions, Simi Mobile Disco wanted an album cover for their album Temporary Pleasure. We sat for days in their studio going, what image represents temporary pleasure? A nice sculpture, a blah, 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 a dog eating a bowl of food, whatever. We couldn't find an idea and then, I can't remember who said it, but somebody said, a giant bubble. So that's what, that's what we did. And then we shot it bursting for the reverse. These images were shot by Jane Stockdale, an amazing photographer. But, you know, all of these ideas, especially with Simeon, are around one core element. So they wanted to do a moiré for their new Unpatterns album. So they took their old logo, made it moiré, made the packaging moiré, made it move in a moiré way. So again, really basic, but applying the same idea several times to different media. And then we wanted to make a music video. We hadn't we made nine music videos for this album, but we wanted to do one that was mostly moiré, but we didn't have anything except for Google SketchUp, so we made a music video on Google SketchUp. You know, the, all of these things are accessible, they're free, they're available for you to use, hack, destroy, turn upside down, you know, discover them, explore them, because you know, they don't cost £2,000 to buy the software for. So, another thing, as you'll see from my speech, I speak a lot, very quickly, and I work a lot, very quickly. That's kind of my uh, approach to design. So I like to come up with ideas quickly. Um, I think that, for me, when I'm looking at the jigsaw puzzle, it's already there, and it's done. And I don't have to really think about it for a long period of time. So often my best ideas are on the phone when the client gives me the pitch. They're like, okay, so we need a music video for Jesse Ware, and we don't really know if we can shoot Jesse, and we just want it to be really colorful. Okay, cool. So we're going to shoot Jesse as a silhouette and then shoot some other inky, colorful stuff, and then we'll make it into a cool video. And they're like, okay, and then we, we did it. So this is what I sent them before I had done any creative on it, using um, other people's work, which is what we do, most graphic designers, before we have to uh, do our own work. Um, and I took some colorful pictures, and I took Jesse's silhouette, and I stuck them together, and then we made the video. This was shot by everyone in the studio, kind of getting around um, a macro lens, paint, uh, ink, sunflower oil, all sorts of things. So, you know, again, everything like tiny in our office, just at, at, at our disposal to use. Costs nothing, nothing, not a penny to make. D don't tell any of my clients that. <laughs> um, uh, now, another quick project was um, another Jesse project. They called me and said, we have, Red Bull called me, they said, we have a billboard. It doesn't have anything on it. We need to have something on it. It has to be interactive, but we can't use digital. Okay, so we're gonna make a halftone pattern that the public have to color in. So, you know, again, my best ideas happen on the phone with the client, um, and that, that's what we did, and uh, that's what it looked like. After it had been colored in, it kind of sat as an actual advert for several weeks. Moving back to DIY, more things that resonate for me are trade, not just, not trade as what I do, but trading as in exchange. Um, all work is trade. You work in exchange for money, but I also work in exchange for work or work in exchange for pleasure. I used to design posters for shows so I could go and see the bands play, and I still do those kind of jobs today. So um, we have an open mail swap with the office. So you send us something, we'll send you something back. And that's been really popular. Not too popular because otherwise <laughs> I'd have a lot of crap and nothing left in my stock room. Um, but popular enough, we do work trades. So London Green Cycles are like the sole distributors of Christiania Dutch cargo bikes. So they said, design me a logo. And I was like, London, Green Cycles, looks like a bike. There's your logo. Wasn't that easy, don't tell them that. Because they gave me this, um, which is the Moros Mobile. Uh, I cycle around London with my dogs in. So again, um, and we still work together. We, we design their website. It's a kind of mutual, they, they, they service my bike, I service their website. <laughs> um, I like to give things away uh, at events, little hand-drawn bits and pieces or um, swap or lottery. 
So, you know, these are things I like to pass on. Um, I like to make my own shit um, <laughs> in many ways. Um, I think that, you know, we are thankfully not limited by manufacture so much anymore with the dawn of 3D printing and the accessibility of kind of maybe perhaps more traditional trades that are emerging like riser printing, screen printing, uh, letterpress are back and they're back for us to use and the more we use them the more they'll be back. Um, I got a maker bot, I don't use it that often because it's a bit of a nightmare but occasionally we get to, to print cool stuff. Screen printed gicle, riso, litho posters um, if you make it and put it somewhere and make a nice picture of it, then you might sell something. Um, and I guess for me, it's a cliche. You can be anything that you want to be, but no longer are we defined by roles such as graphic designer, illustrator, filmmaker, art director. These things are just, you know, shallow terms for what we really are and what we really give to society. And I totally agree with Hemingway Design and everything that, that he and their company say about our value and our contribution. And also, you would sound like a jerk if you stood up here and said, I'm a film director, I'm an illustrator, I'm a graphic designer. But I, I'm, I am not those things. I do those things. I uh, do lots of different things, and that's what I like to do. And actually, you probably thought you were going to come here and see me talk about boring typefaces and triangles, but I didn't. I tricked you. Um, <laughs> and I do this work, and it's fun, and it's also quite selfish um, design, and, and it is to get money and collaborate with people, but really... I too am about sharing and teaching and learning and normally have a slide where I show like my dreadful attempt at 3D design using like Cinema 4D but I'm too embarrassed to show it because I showed it twice before and actually people have come up to me and be like, ooh, that was really bad. <laughs> so I've actually taken it out and also only had 25 minutes instead of 40, which I normally have. So, you know, these are things that I... I do, and, and they're important to me, but more than anything, these, those DIY things that I talk to you about are my key values and, and what I'm working towards spreading and, and hoping that our arts education system will not be lost forever and hoping that everybody will engage in those things and have amazing lives. Um, and lastly, um, I'm, I've started a new business, um, Studio Moros, which has been going for a year. There are four of us. And we're, I'm basically starting from scratch again. Um, and it was because that's what I wanted to do. Um, and I chose to do that instead of doing other things. And I think starting a business in a recession is definitely difficult, but it's something that I am fighting for. So... Thank you for having me.